And changes in privacy affect consciousness. Can the sense of a loss of privacy be connected to, be linked to a loss of sanity itself? I would prefer not to have dealt with these questions, but I had no choice. 36 years ago, my younger brother, Vincent John J. Hendricks, started to manifest symptoms that are generally defined as schizoaffective or paranoid schizophrenic. My experience with him, though, did show me, it made me think about the, the learned discussion of privacy and consciousness, to the point that I feel that discussion vastly underestimates the importance of privacy to consciousness. I would have preferred to leave it to the philosophers, the psychologists, the neuroscientists, the lawyers, and it is heavy lifting. Just looking at the various types of privacy, just a small sampling shows you that. Privacy is a philosophical concept. Privacy is a psychological space. Privacy is a neurophysical state. Privacy is an, a matter of social etiquette. Privacy is a recurrent issue in internet and information technology policy. Privacy is, an amendment, is a right implicit in the first, third, fourth, and fifth amendments to the Constitution. Privacy is asserted as a fundamental human right in Article 12 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that's just a sampling of privacy. This is a sampling of all the many, many, many theories of mechanisms for consciousness over the last couple of decades. Don't stare at it too long, it'll suck your brain into an alternate universe. Okay? But that's a good thing for me, because the science of consciousness remains very much speculative research. That leaves a space for someone like me to make a connection between something to do with what happened to my brother and something to do with the way we live now. During the 1980s, in his early 20s, my younger brother came to believe that the private channel of his stream of consciousness was being intercepted, compromised, today we might say hacked, in such a way that he felt all his inmost feelings and experiences, all his intimacies were being leaked into the public sphere by DJs on the radio stations he listened to. This is the last picture we have of him. It is a photocopy taken from his University of Wyoming at Laramie, student ID. He was a PhD candidate there in Native American history. It was also used in this Have You Seen Me poster from late October 1988. My distant cousin John Keenan was posting that up all around Laramie. But that was only the, sort of the tail end of a larger craziness. He had felt for many years that although he was nobody, there was a vast conspiracy of nuns and priests focused on him. With this Fildiki indifference, he wasn't sure they were human. He thought they might be robotic, flesh automata. I say Fildikian as a reference to a science fiction writer, fellow science fiction writer, Philip K. Dick, and also someone who was purportedly, uh, like my brother, a sufferer from uh, mental health problems, schizoaffective or paranoid. Uh, you know him even if you don't know his name. His story, uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, was made into Blade Runner. Minority Report was based on a story by him called Minority Report. Paycheck, based on a, a Phil Dick story. Adjustment Bureau, based on a Phil, Kip, Phil K. Dick story. Inception, based on a Phil K. There's a lot of them. And the recurring questions in Philip K. Dick's work are what is private, what is human, what is real. My brother, after his first episodes, became obsessed with the works of Philip K. Dick. He felt that Philip K. Dick was a kindred spirit. Philip K. for kindred Dick, that is his middle name. Uh, and the reason he felt that was many of the characters in Philip Dick's work had that similar experience of a sense of loss of privacy contributing to a feeling that they were becoming like all you zombies, like flesh automata. Phil Dick wasn't the first one to address this relationship between privacy and consciousness. The 19th century Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard uh, wrote at length about what he called social chatter, the endless talk of 
private matters in public until we lose a sense of the private that it sort of evaporates away and the distinctions between us as individuals get lost. Now, the last thing I would want to do is to have my brother's private story become more mere chatter fodder. But I am reminded that Kierkegaard also wrote that authentic, impassioned speech can be an antidote to chatter. When I tell you that my brother in his last mania was so intellectually incandescent, it was like speaking with a supernova. I had to avert my eyes. And too soon thereafter, that light, his light, collapsed beyond the event horizon of his eyes, down to some singularity of madness from which that light could never again escape to infinity. When I say that, I hope you don't think I'm just contributing to chatter. My experience with my brother and his interest in Philip K. Dick uh, made me see, helped me see, that my brother's robotic clergy and Philip K. Dick's androids were very much like what conscious theorists call philosophical zombies. That is, in fact, a cover from a magazine. Yes, there is a magazine called Philosophy Now. The head on that zombie is a noted consciousness theorist, David Chalmers, who has uh, written extensively about what's called the hard problem of consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness is this. Why aren't we just input-output devices? Uh, all our depth on the surface, like machines. Why is it that our waking experience is accompanied by this virtual reality, multi-sensory consciousness movie always running in our heads? My angle on it's a little bit different. Not so much, why is this consciousness movie that run, runs alongside physical existence, why is it there? Not so much of that is, why is that consciousness movie always such a very private screening, an auteur project of the individual primarily, by the individual, for the individual? Why? Traditionally, philosophers have assumed that consciousness is a prerequisite for privacy. I hold the opposite, that privacy is a pre prerequisite for consciousness. And it makes possible something wonderful in consciousness. Consciousness, you see, is a world that names the world. But that world that names the world, the opposite of that kind of consciousness is not unconsciousness. The opposite of that kind of consciousness is oppression. Oppression proceeds most powerfully, degrades consciousness most powerfully by attacking privacy. But I want to address this not only functionally in the present, but evolutionarily. It's often today speculated that waking consciousness has arisen from REM, the REM sleep dream consciousness. I hold that privacy emerges from that high arousal threshold state that surrounds REM sleep, that state in which we're very almost immune to external stimuli, when our brains focus inward on what are called their default mode networks. But just as privacy is a descendant of that high arousal state threshold, so too is that, that high arousal state itself a descendant of something much older. Descendant, it's an evolutionary transformation of something extremely old, a very old defense mechanism called tonic immobility, also known as thanatosis, also known as playing possum or playing dead. And the role of that was to get rid of unwanted attention primarily from predators. That is a living spider playing a dead spider. It's an arthropod. They go back 300 million years. The Carboniferous. That is a living frog playing a dead frog. That is a living snake playing a dead snake. That is a possum playing possum. <laughs> the deeper state of privacy then is the realization that it, it, it itself can be considered a highly evolved, highly refined mechanism, over 300 million years old, for being left alone. Privacy itself can be analogized to many things. It's part matrix, part chamber of secrets. Con it's privacy is the place to stand, consciousness the lever with which we move the world. Just as silent spaces in 
between the notes make music possible, so too private space between thoughts makes consciousness possible. Privacy is neither simply conscious or simply unconscious. It's a boundary property, rather like the fact that snowflakes are neither merely ice nor merely wind. But it's something more than that. Privacy is the emptiness that makes fullness possible. Privacy is that latent potency, that potent latency that eventuates in conscious experience. It's like the mushroom mycelium spawn bed, which you don't really usually see at all. It's virtually inv invisible. But given rain, it eventuates in mushrooms. Privacy is the nothing to hide in, without which we have everything to fear. In the 35 years since Philip K. Dick died, our world has in many ways seemed to become more and more like the world he prophesied, the world he feared. The threat of big data and predictive analytics to free will. See Phil Dick's minority report again. The dangers of mass and niche social chatter. See the three stigmata of Palmer Eldridge, which also takes place on a climate changed world. The dangers posed by an Orwellian overt surveillance or a Kafka-esque covert information gathering, see book and movie of a scanner darkly. The dangers posed by machine autonomy and artificial intelligence, see do androids dream of electric sheep, also known as Blade Runner in the movie. And the dangers of an authoritarian, fascist, alternate history, alternate facts, post-truth world. The funhouse mirror mind of Philip K. Dick has affected and really reflects what we see. The advent of ubiquitous digital social media has made our world look more like his. Now I'm not saying that just because, I'm not saying we're all going to turn into paranoid schizophrenics or philosophical zombies because we overshare on social media. But I do think we are conducting a vast, unregulated experiment on human consciousness. There are even certain attacks on human consciousness that you can see when you look at them. There's this sort of brute force invasion of privacy, knocking doors down, wiretapping that my brother so feared. There's the monetization of privacy, usually by corporations making money off of privacy. The inundation of privacy, the flooding of it with social chatter. The sublimation of privacy. The almost unconscious giving away of personal information to the public sphere. And finally, the trivialization of privacy, which usually runs like this. On the net, everybody knows everything about everyone forever, so privacy is dead, get over it. I don't think that's a good idea. What that tends to do is drive that depth of human beings that unpredictable, unprogrammed, non-machine-like thing upward, making it more shallow, making it more predictable, making it more machine-like, making it in many ways too shared. The result is a leveling and a shallowness. When all the depth is on the surface, not only is there no more depth, but superficial begins to look like a superpower. And the result of that is this, that the two modes of oppression, the two definitions, the personal definition of oppression, mental pressure or distress, and the political definition of oppression, unjust treatment or control, tend to merge together. Now, we've tried to do some good things in response to this. Already, we've seen open letters advocating strong guidelines for the production of strong AI. We've seen the development of Lex Informatica, the law of information technologies, which includes not only recognizing the responsibility of data collectors, but also the rights of data subjects, including the right to be forgotten by silicon. We made some mistakes. This is an actual uh, list of descriptors from the TSA's pre-terror behavior detection program. It has turned out to be a tremendous flop. But in many law enforcement agencies and organizations across the United States, we have these risk assessment algorithms, which are supposed to be, in a very Phil Dickian sense, about pre-crime. It's consciousness profiling information. There needs to be protection. 
for consciousness. A model we might look at is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, which pro provides a limited protected status for the individual's genetic information, including the prohibition of the use of that information, a genetic disposition, predisposition for disease, for instance, the prohibition of that use of that information if in employment or insurance decisions. And lastly, there's us. That's St. Mary of Egypt. She was a mystic. The mystics, the shamans, the meditators have long told us that if we wish to strengthen consciousness, we must emphasize chatterless mind over mindless chatter. Mr. Tagomi, who's a character in both uh, the TV series and the book, Man in the High Castle, knows that. He is that sort of person. But at a deeper level, we need to look at the fact that the public and the private only gain their fullest meaning in reference to each other. Loss of subjectivity is loss of objectivity. No one has the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But distinct private conscience, consciousness means Unique consciousness means we can share and compare our pieces of the truth. That is crucial to the survival of societies. Society is not a prerequisite for the existence of privacy. Privacy is a prerequisite for the existence of society. Diving deep can be dangerous. Perhaps a mystic is a diver who can swim, and a schizophrenic is a diver who can't. My brother did not end well. He drowned in beauty, untimely shrouded in myriad fine, cold pieces of lace called snowflakes. That is, he froze to death in a late season snowstorm in the Laramie Mountains of Wyoming. A private act so private that we'll never know whether it was a suicidal accident or an accidental suicide. The forces arrayed against individual human consciousness are powerful, they're pervasive, they're persistent, and they're largely of our own making. We have our work cut out for us, trying to save private mind from the things my brother feared and that Philip K. Dick prophesied. Our great challenge is to keep pace in our understanding and response to those, that array of forces which is moving at the accelerating pace of technology itself. Never since tomorrow has today seemed so yesterday. We have our work cut out for us, but it's a work always already begun, always yet to be done, and always worth the doing. Thank you very much.